Hey! 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 I want to welcome our dear brother, Leke, to the podium. Leke, um, how long have you been there for? Just two years. Just two years. Seems like forever. Like I said before, um, the people that we um, was led to speak to, to speak today are people who have demonstrated faithfulness and are trustworthy. I want to echo that because the Bible doesn't just say anybody should do anything. Um, so I um, want to honor you publicly, man of God, um, for your trustworthiness and your faithfulness. Um, and I know this day marks something you know special to you. Um, as God is elevating or has elevated you. Um, so as a family, we just want to congratulate you and celebrate you. Amen. So, okay. so we're going to pray for the man of God. We're going to receive his word. And because he's a man, he's going to finish in 20 minutes, Emmanuel. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> oh, shots fired. Amen. Father, we thank you for this man of God. God, I speak the word in Isaiah 50, that you would give him the tongue of a learned, Father, that he may know how to speak a word in season, Father, um, to instruct those who are weary to be strengthened, O oh God. So, Father, we just thank you and we honor you for the word in his belly. May it be sweet to our bellies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You have 20 minutes, man of God. I'm going to try my best. Amen. Amen. Um, first of all, I actually just want to say that was amazing, Tony. <laughs> it's funny, me and Tony, we spoke um, last week. I remember she wanted me to go first because she was nervous. Don't know why she was nervous. I mean, I feel like, yeah. I'm joking. No, but honestly, that was an amazing word. And I also just wanted to say thank you to Pastor Aaron and Pastor Susan just for the honor, not just actually to come and speak here today, but really just to be able to partner with you both just with your vision for the house has been an amazing blessing to be here for the last two years. And I, I really do give so much of my growth to just the stewardship that you two have shown over me. Um, I was talking to Ori about this this morning that every single team that I'm on in the house of A&T, I didn't ask to be on any of the teams. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be on any of the teams if I'm being honest, but it's only because I trust Pastor I and Pastor Susan, they've been faithful that I say yes each time. And it really is an honor to be able to truly feel like I'm giving my life to serve here. Um, amen, amen. Cool. Uh, if we could start with the first slide. Okay, if we could go to the next one, actually. Cool. So I want to start off with an introduction of sorts. Um, you know, just a basic one, nothing too complex, just name, background, and what I do. So as you read here, my name is Leke. Background, I'm Nigerian slash British. Woo! Yeah. And what I do, I work in accounting, more specifically audit. So this is probably what 90% of my colleagues actually know about me. Probably, maybe some of them don't even know I'm Nigerian, if I'm being honest. Some of them just, <laughs> yeah, they probably don't know. But I would say that this is very much true. I would argue this is what my reality is, who I am. But I other things that could be So if we go to the next slide, please. Here is an alternative reality. So I've been called many things in my life. I've been called a liar, been called a deceiver. Back in secondary school, a young lady actually called me a psychopath. Yeah, uh, I kind of deserved it, but I'm not going to tell that story. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been called many things throughout my life. Background, you could argue that, oh, thank you so much. You could argue that I have a background of absent fathers, absent grandfathers, absent uncles, just a lineage of men not showing up and doing their part. You could very much argue that that's my background. And what I do, I've done a lot of things. I've stolen sausage rolls from Tesco. I've, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of things. I've lied, I've betrayed, I've sworn. A lot of things that I'm not publicly proud of, but you could very much argue that this is also my reality. It could also very much be true. But moving on to the next slide. Here is another reality. I've been called holy, blameless, a son. My background, not an absent father, but a heavenly father. And, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, a father who's ever present. What else do I do? By the grace of God, I tell the truth. I love, I give, I forgive, I show kindness, I show mercy. Now, if we could go to the next slide. The big question is, which reality is true? 
And honestly, on any given day, you could argue that all of them are true, none of them are true, just one of them is true. But I have to make a choice every single day. If we go into the next slide, please. And it's the same thing with each and every one of us. We each have to make a choice and decision. We could choose to agree with what I would describe as the accuser's reality. I could say, you know what, I am a liar, I am a deceiver, I am someone who betrays, I am someone who steals. And the moment I agree with that reality, I'll live that life. I will start betraying people, I will start deceiving people, because that's who I believe that I am. I could agree with what I would describe as my colleague's reality of me. I'm just a guy from Barking, there's nothing more to my life. My sole purpose here is just to do audit. Yeah, just to go on Excel, I show up, I tick boxes, I go home. That's my entire life, my reality. There's the other alternative, which I would call as the father's reality. He calls me loved, he calls me son, he calls me holy, he calls me blameless. If I agree with that reality, if I show up every single day believing that I am that, I will live that kind of life. I will be the kind of person who is gentle. I will be the kind of person who is loving, who is patient, who is kind. But every single day, I have to choose which one am I going to agree with. Because the truth is, if I don't, I'm going to just fluctuate between all three. Some days I'll wake up and say, you know what? I'm going to be the angry version of me today. It might not have been a conscious decision. I might just say, today I'm going to act with anger. I'm going to act with malice and vengeance. Or I might just say, you know what? Burn this Christianity thing. Let me just grind and do money. Let me just make money. Let me just work my entire life. Forget prayer. Forget everything else. And there were seasons where I did have that, where all my life was just work. But each day I have to choose, or else life will choose for me. And I've decided and realized that when life chooses for me, it's never God's option. It's never the Father's option. It's always either the enemy's one or what man would want me to be. But I didn't come here just to talk about me. So <laughs> if we could get the title up, and if you are taking notes, the title of today's message will be, That's Not You. Cool. So... We're going to do a bit of a Bible study. So if you haven't read your Bible this week, um, here you go. Yeah, <laughs> so, so we're going to start with the book of Ephesians. And I do apologize. When I read the Bible, I like to read quite slowly, ask some questions. So I apologize for that in advance. But starting from verse 17, I'm going to read from the New King James Version. This is too small for me to read from this distance. I'm going to leave that right there. <laughs> so it says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. So immediately my thought goes like this. How do the Gentiles walk? Paul is talking, you know what, don't walk like the Gentiles. Okay, how do they walk? He says, in the futility of their mind. But what does that mean? So verse 18. He says, having their understand, uh, understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. Now I would read this and say, okay, God, why are they alienated from you? Why are they alienated from your life? Do you hate them? Is there something about these Gentiles, these people in the world that you say, you know what, you just have no business with them? And that's not true because he says, Paul speaking says, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, it's the ignorance that is in them that causes them to be alienated. It's the blindness of their heart that separates them from the life of God. It's not God doing this. God isn't saying to them, you're in the world, so I don't want anything to do with you. It's their own ignorance. It's their lack of understanding that separates them from that life. But carrying on, verse 19. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to walk all uncleanness with greediness. Now, I'd pause again. So, who's Paul talking about? He's talking about the Gentiles. He's not talking about necessary believers. He's not talking about me and you, hopefully. <laughs> He's not talking about me and you. He's talking about those who are in the world who have given themselves over to their own desires, their lustful desires. But he speaks to me and you in verse 20. He says, but you, a and a new thing, London, you, Tony, you, Moffat, you, Dami, you have not so learned Christ. AKA, this is not how Christ has taught you. AKA, this is not the truth revealed when you study Christ. He goes on further saying, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, verse 22. So what is this truth? This truth is that you put off concerning your former conduct. That's a key word here, okay? Former, we're going to come back to that. Former conduct. The old man, another key word there, old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, we are, I feel like if you read the Bible, you might be used to certain phrases, oh, renew your mind, renew your mind, but what does that actually mean? It's, it sounds nice, yeah, just renew your mind, but what does that actually look like? It looks like the putting on of the new man. 
which was created according to God in true righteousness. If we're being honest, we probably don't even know what that actually means. Like, what does it mean putting on the new man? What does that actually look like? Fortunately, Paul's a great writer. So, in verse 25, he says, Therefore, so this is what it looks like to put on the new man. This is what it looks like to be in that body of righteousness, of holiness. It means putting away lying. He says, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. He goes on further to describe this picture. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. 27, he says, nor give place to the devil. If we go to 28, please. He says, let him who stole, like me, (laughs) let him who stole, still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. And verse 29, he says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. So no more lie, no more deceitful talk, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. I say, we'll stop there for now. I think one of the things about this verse that I love so much is it reminds me of a song from Sunday school. Um, Tony wasn't the only one who used to go to Sunday school, yeah. (laughs) But it reminds me of a song from Sunday school. It was... I'm not going to sing it because I don't want to do that to you guys, but (laughs) it says, um, the things I used to do, I do them no more. There's been a great change since I'm born again. And I truly want, I truly believe that the Lord wants to encourage us, A&T, because you're born again, because you're safe, because you're renewed, because you're the new man, the things you used to do, do them no more. The things that you used to struggle with, let go of those struggles. And look, I didn't come here to just say, okay, be, you're a Christian, so be Christian, or you're a Christian, so do Christian things, or you're saved, so do the things that you're supposed to do. Because more than uh, our Christians don't do the right things crisis, I think in the church, we actually struggle more with an identity crisis. We don't know who we actually are. We don't know who we are actually called to be. And I think we show it in our conversations. We show it in how we talk to one another. We talk about certain struggles, and we paint an image that the old man the former man is still there within us somewhere. As if even though he was crucified on the cross, there's a small part of us that believes that, you know what, when I'm angry, it's the old man, he's come back alive again. But if we go to the book of Romans, let's go to Romans 6, verses 6 to 7. Paul says it clearly. He says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Yet somehow we still come through into church and we act as if that man is still there, as if, you know what, there's a part of him that still has some power over us, still some control over us. It's an identity issue. We somehow look in the mirror and we imagine ourselves as part saved, part not saved. Where some days we're saved, some days we're not saved, some days we're holy, some days we're evil. We go and do this like Jekyll and Hyde kind of switch, but that is not who we are. It's the crisis. It's the world telling us that this is who we are, where we're sometimes good, sometimes bad. And it reminds me of like this, I don't know, when I was preparing for this, I got this weird analogy in my head of, imagine I came into a church today and I said, you know what, even though I'm 23, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a 12-year-old today. So you know what, I'm going to put on 12-year-old clothes. I'm going to wear size 7 shoes. I'm going to wear the clothes that I used to wear. I'm going to talk like I was when I was 12. Not only would I look extremely funny, I wouldn't even be able to walk properly. I wouldn't even be able to, I'd literally be cause myself pain because I'm trying to be what I used to be. And it's literally the same thing with many believers in the sense of because we want to be what we used to be, we're causing ourselves pain. Imagine that I came into it and Pastor Ayo said, you know what, okay, you're going to teach today. I said, oh, no, no, 12-year-old me, I can't do that. I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm too nervous. If you saw me at 12, I wouldn't even speak to anyone. I was super shy. I, used, I remember my first week of secondary school. I literally didn't talk to anyone. I was hiding in the library. So imagine I came and said, you know what, no, I'm the 12-year-old version of me. I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to do this because I've retracted back to that old self. But then the question I would have is, we still sin. We still make mistakes. So what's going on? How come, even though I am saved, even though I am in this new body, I still make mistakes? If we could go to Romans 12, please, which says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Why do I still sin and make these mistakes? I'm copying the behavior of the world still. I'm still doing the things and reacting in ways that the world would. 
and it might not even necessarily be intentional. Like, we have to be honest with ourselves. For example, I got saved at, let's say, maybe the age of 19. So for 19 years, I was learning a different way of living life. I have 19 years of memory of, you know what, when someone shouts at you, you shout back. When someone pushes you, you push back. When someone swears at you, you swear back. When I got saved, all those memories didn't disappear. I mean, they didn't disappear. All of those behaviors and patterns that I learned throughout all those years didn't just disappear because I said, you know what, I'm going to be a Christian today. Yeah. They're still there. They're still stored up in here. So even though my spirit is saved, even though I am saved, my mind still remembers all of those former things. My habits still exist. So the truth is that even though we can be saved, the way we used to behave, the way we used to think might still be there. This is why the Bible talks so much about renewing the mind. This is why the Bible urges so much for us to learn Christ. This is why it literally says, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. See, we could be saved but still think like we used to think. We could be saved but still conduct ourselves in the old way. Because how we think shows up in our actions. It goes back to that beginning part of which reality is true. If I think and believe that I am the old man, that I still have those tendencies, that I am still struggling with those things, I will respond that way. If I go and I say to myself, you know what, you're a jealous person, you're an envious person. When an opportunity comes where I could either choose to not be envious or envious, I'm going to lean towards the one that I keep telling myself. Like some of us, the way we talk about ourselves, we say, you know what, this is the reason why I struggle with the concept of being shy. Like when people say, you know, I'm a shy person, I can't speak, it, oh, it hurts my heart so much. Because I think we affirm certain personalities that the world has given us. You know, I'm a shy person. I used to tell myself all the time, I'm a shy person. And because I told myself I'm shy, I bought into it. And so when opportunities came to speak, I said, I'm not going to speak because I'm a shy person. When opportunities came to step out of my comfort zone, I said, I'm not going to do it because I'm a shy person. It's not what I do. Shy people don't go and do presentations. Shy people don't go and talk on a pulpit. Shy people don't do those things. See, what we tell ourselves becomes our reality, even when it's not. So when God is telling you you're bold, you're courageous, when God is telling you you're strong, but then you leave this building and you talk to your friend and he says, oh, bro, man, you're, you're actually so stupid. You're actually so dumb. And you feel like, yeah, you know what? Maybe he's right. Everything that you learn on Sunday is gone. And now when the opportunity comes, what's your first thought? I am dumb. I actually am kind of stupid. You know what? Let me not put myself forward for that position. Let me not apply for that job. Let me not go into this, into that. There has to be an intentional unlearning of certain things that we've stored up throughout our entire lives. It shows up in so many different ways. It shows up in our speech Sometimes the way we talk to one another is because of how we've grown up. There's certain ways that, uh, you know, actually, okay, you know what I'm going to say anyway. There's certain ways where I've even seen how I might communicate with Ore based on how I've lived life before I even met her. Certain ways where in past relationships or even interactions with my family, I've realized, you know, this is how we deal with arguments. So when we come into a disagreement, I'm like, this is how I should respond. This is what works. But we have to remember there's a new way of doing things. See... This is why Bible study is so important. Bible study isn't just us gaining knowledge. It's not us just trying to learn facts. Jesus Christ is literally our curriculum. Like, we study Christ. Like, why? When Jesus says, come unto me, we all remember, you know, you are weary and heavy laden. But he said, learn from me. He said, learn. Like, we literally are supposed to read the Bible and say, okay, how does Jesus respond? See, that in, when we think of, let's say, someone's evil or someone's wicked in your life, what did Jesus say? He said, pray for them. He said, be kind to them. He said, God is kind even to the ungrateful, even to the evil, even to the unrighteous. So when a situation comes when someone who is like that enters into our life, we think, how would Jesus respond? I don't know if any of you remember this, but back in the day when people used to wear those bands, I used to say, what would Jesus do? The sad thing is, a lot of the time, I don't even know what Jesus would do because I didn't read it. I haven't studied it. So we're saying, what would Jesus do? I'm thinking, okay, I don't know what Jesus would do, but what would Pastor Ayo do? But imagine Pastor Ayo had that same... Um, full process. And he's thinking, what did this guy do? What did that guy do? That's how we end up with false doctrines. That's how we end up with false behaviors. Because legit, no one's reading the Bible. Everyone's reading people and no one's reading Christ. So we need to be careful in the sense of how am I supposed to respond in any given situation? We look at Jesus in the word. How am I supposed to respond when, you know what, I have to make a decision between two different things. What did Jesus do when picking the disciples? He went to a quiet place and he prayed. He prayed. So what should I do when I need to make a decision? I should pray. When I'm thinking about who to interact with and dedicate so much of my life to, what should I do? I should probably pray, you know. 
What was Jesus' pattern in life? Well, he got up in the morning and he prayed. He studied the word. Maybe that's something I should also do. It's these kind of things that we only realize when we study the word. And so, I guess, I think time is fast, man. I've got like, maybe like two minutes left. I guess two major takeaways. If we could go to the next verse, please. James 1, 22 to 25. It says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, hey, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. It goes on to talk about and describe him as almost like a man who looks in a mirror and forgets who he is. That's literally what it's like when we read the word and we don't do it. When you look at ourselves, Jesus tells us who are we supposed to be. He describes us. He describes the actual image. He describes how we respond to certain things. But then we don't do it. We go back into the world. We've literally forgotten who we are. So now we respond in anger. When we respond in anger, we've forgotten who we are. When we lie, instead of telling the truth, we've forgotten who we are. When we respond in jealousy, we've forgotten who we are. But that's why we need to not just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Like, I just imagine a, a standard of Christianity where all Christians actually look like Christ. Where our goal isn't necessarily coming and doing events or coming and doing certain engagements and us doing, not to say I don't appreciate, I do appreciate this, <laughs> but more than me coming up and talking here, I'm more focused on, you know what, I just want to look like Jesus. I just want to know who Jesus is. Like how does he think? How does he reason? What is his way of living life? And I think there's a need for us to change our focus back to him. Like he is the core message. He is the reason, literally what Tony said, he is the reason we are here. Jesus is. It's not because we like to sing songs. It's not because that. I do like you guys, but hey, yo, if you guys weren't here, I'm going to still serve Jesus in it. So <laughs> life, me, life goes on. But that should be our focus. Community is important, yes. Jesus is, he's everything. He's literally everything. And so I just want to really encourage us. So two main takeaways. One, don't agree with what isn't true. Like, just because your circumstances might say that you're a jealous person, just because your parents might have told you that you're a wicked child, just because your ex might have told you that you're selfish, just because your friends might have told you that, oh, uh, you know what, you're not going to become anything, it doesn't mean you need to agree with that reality. Choose to agree with what the Father says. And then the second thing, study what the Father says. We can't agree with something that we don't know. We can't act in a way that we've never learned. So we need to go into the Word, study it, and become it. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning into today's session. I am sure you were encouraged, you were edified, you were convicted, you were all types of things that led you to being edified in Christ. I want to also just give you the opportunity, if you've been blessed in any way, to help support the ministry through giving. Um, this would be a perfect time for you just to you know, water the, the plant that's been feeding you some good word in the season of your life. So I want to bless you and thank you in advance in supporting us and also invite you to follow us on All Things Social and New Thing London, London being LDS. I look forward to seeing you on the journey.